Last week, I highlighted three REITs on this channel that I think are quite opportunistic right now because I expect them to hike their dividend later this year. But it's not all sunshines and rainbows in the REIT sector. And in fact, I think that there are quite a few REITs that will also cut their dividend in 2024. Hey everyone, this is Yusia. I run a small investment firm that specializes in REIT investing. And in today's video, I want to talk to you about three REITs that I would avoid because I think they will likely cut their dividend in 2024, possibly in 2025. Before I get started, I wanted to remind you that I plan to soon post a few interviews with REIT CEOs on this channel. This is typically the type of content that we reserve for the paying members of High Yield Landlord, which is our REIT newsletter. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss out on this premium content, make sure to subscribe to this channel. So the first read I expect to cut its dividend is called Apollo Commercial Real Estate Finance and sticker symbol is ARI. This is a very popular mortgage rate and as I've explained in some of my previous videos, I think that mortgage rates are going to suffer severe challenges in the coming years. Their problem is that they lent way too much money in 2021 and 2022 when interest rates were ultra low, cap rates were some of the lowest levels ever and real estate valuations were near their peak. This is also the case of Apollo Commercial Real Estate Finance. I'll put a chart on the screen where you'll see that it lent way more money in 2022 than the previous years combined. These loans may have had reasonable terms back then in 2022 with LTVs in the 60 to 70 percent range and solid interest coverage ratios. But the problem is that then interest rates surged in the following years. And as a result, these loans have now become a lot riskier. In many cases, the LTVs have expanded dangerously close to 100%, which essentially means that the equity of the borrower has been wiped out. And in some cases, the borrower is also now struggling to make interest payments because many of these loans had variable rates. This is what recently prompted KKR Real Estate Finance, which is another mortgage rate, to cut its dividend nearly in half. And I think that many other mortgage rates, including Apollo Commercial, will follow the same path in the coming quarters. To date, its dividend yield is very high at 12.5%, but the problem here is that it's payout ratio is high as well at around 90% and that leaves very little room for error. Nearly half of its loan portfolio is backed by hotels and offices, which would be some of the worst impacted by a coming recession. These are some of the most cyclical assets of commercial real estate. Moreover, it also has about 15% exposure to residential properties, which are performing better, relatively speaking. But the problem of these assets is that they traded at very low cap rates in 2022 when Apollo issued many of these loans. And with cap rates now expanding, the LTVs have risen dangerously close to 100%. Finally, another thing that's concerning about Apple Apollo is that more than half of its portfolio is actually in Europe, which is performing even worse than the US because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is hurting the economy of the broader European continent. So with all of that in mind, I think it's quite likely that Apollo will face growing losses from loan defaults in the coming quarters, just like KKR Real Estate already has, and this will likely prompt the management to readjust its dividend. The company already cut its dividend once in 2020 during the pandemic, and so they, they don't really have any long dividend growth track record anyway ways that they would be ruining by cutting it again and the market is not giving them any credit so they might as well readjust it to mitigate future risks. And if you listen closely to the last conference call, I think that the CEO actually gave a small hint of a potential cut later this year. Here's what he said. As I've stated many times previously, the dividend is ultimately dependent on board action and it is reviewed and discussed ultimately declared by the board on a quarterly basis while it's subject to the board approval. At present, our current modeling for future indicates that we remain comfortable with the current dividend level of 35 cents per share. We will obviously review it with the board on a go forward basis. But in light of questions that we anticipated, I want to provide that context at this time. Some of you may take this as a reassurance that the dividend is sustainable, but I think that the fact that they even had to say this in the introductory comments of their call is quite concerning and I think that it's a bit of a hint that a cut is likely on the table. Before I go into the second read, could you please do me a huge favor and click the like button if you think that this content is valuable. I'm doing my best to not just present the good reads and what I'm excited about, but I'm also trying to show you the, the bad and ugly side of the read sector to make sure that you don't overlook some important risks that could lead to significant capital losses. The second read that I expect to cut its dividend once more is called Global Net Least, ticker symbol GNL. This is a read that I've discussed quite a few times on this channel and I've pointed out that I expected to cut its dividend because the REIT is poorly managed, it's over leveraged, it owns a lot of very poor assets and the company has a horrible track record. Well, sure enough, they just announced another dividend cut in their most recent earnings call. Here's what the management said. 
Our near-term strategic approach also involves a planned reduction of global net lease annual dividend from $1.42 to $1.10 per share, increasing the amount of annualized cash by $74 million to further reduce leverage. This reflects the company's continued commitment to strengthening its balance sheet while maintaining a disciplined dividend policy. But the problem here is that even that's not enough in my opinion. Following the most recent dividend cut, their payout ratio is in the low 80s, which is still above average for net lease rates. The management explains that they think that they can maintain a slightly higher payout ratio because they earn a larger portion of their revenue from investment grade ready tenants, but I actually think that's the opposite. Despite having a lot of strong tenants, their portfolio is actually one of the weakest in the net lease sector, and this is well reflected in having one of the lowest occupancy rates as well at 96%. Today, the average lease term is just around six years, which is among the lowest in the net lease property sector. Then they also own a lot of single tenant office buildings, which likely have close to zero equity value at this point following the recent expansion in cap rates. And then finally, they've bought in recent years a lot of industrial properties at really high cap rates because these are older properties with a single tenant. And in case of a vacancy, the future value will be highly uncertain. So yes, it is true that many of its tenants have investment grade ratings, but in this specific case, I actually think that this is a headwind for the company because as leases expire, investment grade rate tenants will hold even greater bargaining power, allowing them to push for rent concessions or tenant improvements. The management has one of the worst track records in the entire REIT sector, still haven't failed to produce a positive total returns since going public in 2025, almost 10 years now. And I think that they are yet again making another mistake by not cutting the dividend enough to preserve cash, to deleverage the balance sheet and strengthen their portfolio. Therefore, I continue to avoid the stock. I think it's quite likely that they will once more have to cut their dividend later this year or possibly in 2025. And then the third read that I think is likely to cut its dividend is called Easterly Government Properties, ticker symbol DEA. This is a very popular read because of two key reasons. The first one is that it's offering a near 10% dividend yield. And the second reason is that most of its tenants are government agencies. And as such, a lot of investors really see DEA as a real estate version of buying treasuries because your dividend is paid by the government. Government. It's, uh, it's fully backed by the US government, so it should be safe. And on top of that, since you're buying real estate, you may even enjoy additional inflation protection, which you wouldn't have with treasuries. But there are quite a few issues here. The first one is that the dividend is not fully covered. Then secondly, they have quite a bit of debt. And then thirdly, they own a lot of single tenant office buildings, which have very uncertain releasing prospects. As long as they have years left on their leases, these properties will be just fine and they will keep earning steady cash flow. Because yes, it is true that the US government is is a great tenant to have. It's, it's not going to default on its leases, but the problem is that as these leases then gradually expire, I think that a lot of space will be vacated, or at the very least, DEA is going to have to offer significant tenant improvements and rent concessions to keep the US government as its tenant. On the most recent earnings call, an analyst called John Kim nicely framed the issue that DEA is today facing, and here's what he said. My question is just a follow-up on Michael's on the dividend. Your payout ratio was 118% last year, if you assume growth of 4% per year, that will take you five years to cover it. And I would add here that a 4% annual growth rate is, in my opinion, way too optimistic for DA because they have very limited rent escalations on their leases. They cannot grow accredibly by issuing new shares and buying additional properties. Their cost of equity is simply too high. And then thirdly, their interest expense will also rise in the coming years. The REIT has really failed to grow on a per share basis now for, for many years in a row, despite continuing to expand its portfolio. And with the cost of capital being higher than ever, I don't see that changing anytime soon. So I just don't understand the optimism from the management on their most recent earnings call. In my opinion, there's a really wide discrepancy between what the management is saying and how the company is really performing. There was actually another analyst called Michael Lewis who even pushed back on the positive commentary by the management. And here's what he said on the call. Just on the dividend, you talked about the predictability of cash flow in relation to the dividend policy. But obviously, when you said that dividend, you didn't predict obviously that you'd be materially below your cash flow. You raised the dividend in Q3 2021 you haven't raised it since Q3 2022. I guess the company is built for stability and I know dividend is a big piece of that. But I guess this goes back to kind of other questions people ask. It sounds like you're willing to fund this for material amount of time, just confirming, I guess. And so you can tell from his question that this analyst even is not really understanding what's going on because they're not covering their dividend, uh, which clearly is not what they expected when they set this dividend years ago. And the market is not giving them any credit having priced the company now at a 10% dividend dividend yield, so why not cut it to start addressing? 
addressing their debt and their coming lease expirations. I've seen similar situations play out in the past where the management as well as the board stubbornly refused to cut the dividend for a while. I think that Medicals Properties Trust was a great example of that in recent years and you, you can look now and see that it put them in an even tougher situation in the future. And so for this reason I'm not interested in buying shares of the REIT and this is quite unfortunate because I think that the valuation is now relatively low and if they cut their dividend this would actually address a lot of my concerns about the company but because they are not I continue to avoid the stock. This is really a great example of why you need to be very selective when investing in REITs. This is a vast and versatile sector with over 1000 companies worldwide investing in over 30 countries, 20 different property sector and while there are some REITs that are very attractive today, there are some others that you should avoid at all costs. Now if you want to access my entire real money REIT portfolio, you can join High Yield Landlord which is my REIT newsletter for two week free trial. It will give you instant access to all of my holdings, you won't be charged anything the first 14 days so feel free to come and check it out and see our research. If you don't like it, you can cancel at any time and once again otherwise if you could please click the like button that really helped me a lot to grow this channel subscribe to not miss our coming read co interviews and otherwise you had my next one bye bye